This is Life After Sports Podcast with your host, Kevin Johnson. Uh, we have a special guest on here tonight. This is episode 20. I'm excited for this, uh, for this guest because uh, we go way back, you know. Uh, but I just want to introduce you. I, we have a special guest. Her name is Marsha Vett Hooker Flintall. And uh, she's an Olympian, uh, mother, wife, and also a future nurse. And so tonight, I'm glad to, to have you on this show. Uh, I'm excited to just to go into detail with you about your life and your journey and what you've been doing as well with your transition after sports. So um, let's go. Let's, let's jump right into it. All right, let's do it. <laughs> so just for those who, who don't really, you know, who may know a little bit about you but don't know a whole lot, uh, let's talk about your childhood and your adoles adole adolescent life. So um, let's talk about your journey as a child. Where you were um, born? Where I was born. Um, grew up as a military child. Um, my dad was in the Army. Um, so every couple to four years, we were constantly moving. Um, played outside a lot. Um, have a younger sister. She's uh, three years younger than me, Destiny. Grew up together. Um, Dad got out of the military. We lived in San Antonio. That's where I spent most of my years. We lived overseas in Germany for a bit, El Paso, but we ended up in San Antonio. Um, that's where I went to high school, uh, middle school, elementary, and then I went to the University of Texas. <laughs> but um, had a had a blessed childhood. Um, my dad was an athlete. My mom was an athlete, so it was always competitive in the house with me and my sister and my parents. So had a good childhood growing up. So majority of your childhood you was in San Antonio, Texas. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, when did you fall in love with sports? Man, I feel like I had to be like six or seven years old, just loving to play outside. My dad uh, played a lot of basketball growing up. When I was growing up, he uh, played in the military leagues. So there was always a game. I always watched him play. So my first love was basketball. I just knew I was going to the WNBA in basketball. <laughs> You know, and but uh, every year I did every sport, volleyball, basketball, and track. And when I was running track, I was noticing I was beating people. And I was like, well, I'm just using track to get in shape for basketball. But then those letters started rolling in when I was in um, high school. And I ran AAU track and placed well there and started getting noticed by colleges. And I was like, man, I could probably punch my ticket in track thing. So mm. after I graduated from high school, I went on a track scholarship. Okay. Now, as a child, because I know every child has their different aspirations. I think a lot of times, and this is a quote that I heard when I was doing a conference um, about uh, as a, you know, you, you go to sleep with a, you, you go to sleep with a purpose or you go to sleep with a dream, you wake up with a purpose. So right. in, in regards to your aspirations, what was your dream? Like, what did you dream as a young child? Well, first off, I dreamed on being a veterinarian. That's what I wanted to be. Um, then I went through okay. a stint in high school and middle school where I wanted to be a police officer slash detective, work FBI, I was into that. And then as I got older in high school and actually into college, but I, I, see, I feel like you're still a kid in college the first couple of years, that's yeah. when I started developing an aspiration to really, really be a professional track athlete. You know, I had goals and dreams in high school, like I'm going to the Olympics, I'm gonna make the Olympic team, but it really just was right there in front of me. I could smell it when I got to college, so. Went okay. there. Now, um, I want you to talk a little bit about your college experience at UT at the University of Texas. Um, I, I know that's uh, a lot of I, I've interviewed another person who went on, on, you know, on our show. We interviewed another person, uh, Frank Ocam. And yeah, so, yeah. Uh, look, I already know <laughs> the, the University of Texas, you guys, y'all network is like y'all are close to each other. You know, you yeah. may not talk every day, but that that uh that uh that fellowship in regards to where you went to school and and holding that school in high regards um is it, is a great it's a great uh memorial for you guys in regards to just understanding where you came from so talk a little bit about your college experience um well it was just awesome to sign a letter of intent to the university of texas i live in burlington north carolina right now so anybody who's north carolina they know that texas is like the unc or duke of north carolina so the sign at uh, the University of Texas, it was just, everybody wants to be a Longhorn. I'm about to be a Longhorn on scholarship, you know, and I get to do what I love to do. Uh, but Texas is just, all I can think about is pride. There's so much pride on that campus because there's great athletes. There's, there's um, extremely smart people that come from all over the world to go to that school. So it's just pride 
it's just the University of Texas. We bleed orange. You I mean you don't understand it till you go there. Till you go you there, huh? Experience it. I took my husband there when I got inducted to the Hall of Honor, and he got to just experience that vibe. Like I said, now you see, like this is where I went to school. This Ooh. is what it was like. This was about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, um, so at just your experience there at at the uh, at the University of Texas. Talk about the the records that you broke. Um, I mean, just the experience, just the whole experience itself. Not only as a student athlete, but as a student as well. Like you, you talked a little bit about that experience, but as a student athlete, what experience? What are the highlights of your career as a college athlete? Um, when I first got to college, I didn't really take it too serious. I mean, I grew up really sheltered, so when I got there, it was like I'm free. So I actually went through my first semester. I was on academic probation because I didn't take a serious one one class. But um, so the best experience academically was pulling myself up out of that and ending up, you know, with like a three five, three seven when it came down to it. Um, so I had to really buckle down. And then I really, I really believe when I buckle down in the classroom, I buckle down on the track too. And I saw the results. Um, I think I learned to be tough when I went to the University of Texas. Because, like, if you don't do what you're supposed to do in the classroom, you're going home, no matter how good of an athlete you are. So, yeah, I learned a lot of toughness there. Okay. Well, uh, based on our interview, we're, we're doing, we're talking about, I call it, you talk about your pre-career, you talk about your in-career, and then we go straight into post-career. So uh, let's jump right into your in-career. So uh, let's discuss your journey and uh, of your competition during your professional career. Um, I didn't um, run my senior season at the University of Texas. I went pro. Um, I signed with Adidas. So um, I know most people know, some people don't. Track is a lot more prevalent in the European countries. So you run yeah. a, circuit of, a circuit of track in the United States, and then you go overseas to run, and we have about a two- to three-month season over there. Um, so track has afforded me the opportunity to really travel around the world. I've seen places I probably don't think I would ever see, places people dream about. I'm there for a couple of days, and I'm out to somewhere else. Um, but competed against some of the best people in the world. Um, it's just a great experience. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, what was the most remarkable accomplishment that you achieved in your career? Um, Something that you're just so proud of, like, you know what, that was it. That was that moment that I could think about. I don't know. There's so many moments. Uh, of course, making the Olympic team, because um, that's something that, a goal that you always have set for yourself. Like, I'm, I remember as every Olympic year came, by, came around, I'm like, uh, um, I want to make it. I want to make it. So when I got to 2008, I'm like, I'm going to Beijing. I started actually speaking it. I wasn't just saying what I wanted. And I knew what it took to get there. So making that team was an amazing feeling. Um, winning gold medal at World Championships was an amazing feeling. Um, running personal best throughout my career. You know, when, you, when your coach tells you you can run something, and it's just like, that's an outrageously fast time. Like, I think I can run that. And then you get out there and actually run it. Like, it's just some bitters bittersweet moments in that. So... I have a lot, but that's some of them. <laughs> that's some of them. So for those who don't know, so talk about what you competed in. So mm -hmm. what, what, uh, uh, what um, I don't know what the ideal terminology is in regards what to what events. There we go. Uh, there we go. I ran uh, 100 the meters, the 200 meters. I did the long jump. And of course, with the sprints came with like the four by one, um, if we did have a four by two or anything like that, but four by 100 meter relay. Okay. 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 What? What? Now I know for every athlete, there's always one particular one or two that you like. You know what? I own this. Like I, I own this this event. Like I may do the other ones, but which one were you like? You know what? Vet, this is me right here. I own this. Well, um, I always loved running the sprints. That was that. The hundred meters was the glory race. Uh, Two hundred meters. You know, people love to watch something fast. It's quick, and you get a result. Um, but I loved doing the long jump. It was just so much fun. And it didn't feel as, I didn't feel as much pressure in the pit. It's almost like, you know, you're playing the Sam Beach. That's how I felt when I long jumped because it was fun for me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, um, in regards to your biggest challenge, if you had to think about and ponder about what was your biggest challenge as a professional athlete 
what would that have to be? Um, I would say having to be out of touch with reality. I feel like when you're running professional like that overseas, you leave an American world and you enter into a whole nother world and it's, uh, you miss home for a while and then you get conditioned just to being gone. So it's also like a, you have to like readjust when you come back home. Um, just making adjustments. That's one thing. The other, I would say, is just pushing yourself hard every workout. There's some workouts where you know you just got killed or you know you're about to get killed and you just want to give it your all because you have a goal in mind. So it's just about just staying disciplined. Was a That's lot of you. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, what was a lot of your competition overseas? Um, if you, like Jamaica, um, but it was a lot of, always a lot of us to competition in the United States because they're coming from everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you just never know. You'll think it'll be Americans and then someone from Sweden or anywhere. Like, I mean, it's anyone's game. It's whoever's ready that day. So it can yeah. be anyone. So while being a professional athlete, you know, have you ever thought uh, during the process, like, have you ever thought about what life may be after sports? And I know it's 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 such a crazy question because a lot of times, you know, it's you're in a career and you're thinking you have to be thinking about okay well what am i going to be doing when i'm not doing this anymore and i think that that scares a lot of people some people don't want to face that reality of that eventually i'm going to have to figure out what i'm going to do after i'm done with this so talk up a little bit of how you know your mindset in regards to uh what that transition process was in regards to that particular time um when I first went pro, that's not something I even thought about. I'm, mm -hmm. I was young, and all I thought about was uh, I'm running pro. I'm going to have this long career. I'm not even thinking about it. Um, as you run, you know, more years, uh, you see other people start to move out of the sport. And you notice, like, wow, like, this person did this for how, for how long, and now they're not running anymore. Like, what are they going to do after this? This becomes their identity. Um, but I'll say maybe, like, the last – few to the last four years of my career really the last few I was just like okay now what's next like what do I want to do because then on top of it you're tired when you're coming off your career you know it's like it, it is scary because you've always had this constant flow of income you know when your check's coming you know when you're getting paid for running a race you know and you know when it's coming so you make plans for it and you live life accordingly so to know that okay I don't have this income anymore and it, and it might be hard to find a job where I make this amount of money where I can live this way, you know, in a comfortable way I'm used to. So it's definitely scary. But I didn't think about it till towards the end, trying to, like, this could come to an end one day. I think people don't think about that. It sneaks up on them. Yeah, but it, it's so hard to, to think about that when a lot of times as professional athletes, and I'm only speaking based on the interviews that I've done in the past, that you're focused on your plan A. You're not thinking about plan B. It's very hard to think about plan B when you're focused on plan A. And plan A looks real good. It look, oh, it look real good. <laughs> yeah, it looks real good. Like, you don't see no, there ain't no problem, no fog, no smoke. It's looking good. Yeah. Yeah, so it, be, it becomes hard. So uh, jumping into the next segment, you know, talking about post-career, um, let's discuss, you know, when you became a mother and, and how did that transition became a little bit different as well. You know, because a lot of times, you know, it's different. You know, when I've, I've interviewed male uh, interviewees, and it's different. You know, it's different than as interviewing a woman who played a professional sport. Um, and I've learned from my last interview, um, I interviewed LaVon Idilette. That's her last name. She's Olympian. She's a hurdler. And at the particular time, so we were talking. She said, Kevin, when you're Olympian, you're always Olympian. Like you, 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 you don't, you never say former. That don't go. So I learned. Look, I'm over here learning as much as you're learning. I'm learning <laughs> yeah. as well. So when she said that, she said, "Yeah, I never say former because guess what? I can always go back. Like I can right. always decide that. Guess what? I want to, you know, suit back up and go back. So we were talking about that, and then just to jump into the post career, you know, back to the question. Like, let's discuss when you became. You know, you came into motherhood. And what that transition was like for you. I know you have three beautiful kids. Yeah. And so talk about that that transition. And it was rough. Um, I went from be <laughs> being able to go train, go to practice, uh, come home, eat, sleep as long as I want to. I can decide on my way home that I'm going to go home. 
I'm gonna wake up when I wake up because I don't got breakfast tomorrow. I know other responsibility. Definitely a challenge because I went from being able to come home and go to sleep after a hard workout, get something good to eat, curl up and watch a movie on TV and know I don't have anywhere to be and I can rest my body. But when I, I remember when I first had London, having to get up and feed her every four hours, knowing I had to train, it didn't matter how early I went to bed, you know, she needs to be fed and she wants me to feed her. So I had to wake up and finding childcare that I felt comfortable with because she was my first baby, but I still had to train and try to stay dedicated. And I remember my body aching from doing workouts it was definitely like a testament or a test to see if I wanted to keep doing it or keep going because it was tiring. And I did that one more time with Peyton, <laughs> which is my middle daughter. And I trained through with her and it was the same thing. You know, you're, you're tired because at the same time you're a mother first, then you're an athlete, you know, so it was tiring. I will use that word tiring. What well, did you, did you, were you, uh, even though you were training, did you compete? after you had after you had uh london i competed after i had london and i competed after i had Peyton. look you know i i tip first of all i tip my hat off to you i don't have a hat on but you know what i mean <laughs> yeah. um but the other thing is i was watching uh serena williams yesterday mm -hmm. and she you know she beat the girl to go on to the second round she's playing sloan uh sloan stevens next right and uh just to watch her compete and I'm hearing the commentators, right? The commentators are all, they're, they're talking like, yeah, Serena is doing great, but she's not what she used to be. You know, they like, they use it it's so much. I, for a minute, I felt like they said it so much that they, that it felt like they were deteriorating her accomplishments. And I was like, why do you have to keep staying there? Just state that, hey, she's doing great for where she's at right now in her career. And we all know that she had a child, you know, like it's, like, there's not a lot of professional athletes who, after they had a child, they decide to come back and compete. Their body's totally different. Most definitely. And, and it's not, as women in sports, like, it's not viewed the same way. Um, yeah. It's, it's. I won't say frowned upon, because I think that's a very bad word, way to put it, but it's just yeah. like, it's an inconvenience for a woman who maybe has a, has a, a contract with a, any kind of shoe company or anything like apparel company and you get pregnant and now it's just like, oh, well, now you can't really make me money because you're not on the track or now you can't make me money because you're not on the court, you know, or, you know, it's just, it, it's always been a double, kind of a double standard. And um, it's something that here recently has been um, liberated more, but yeah. it's definitely, it's definitely tough because you're always going to be viewed different, but your body feels different. So it's definitely a different level of intestinal fortitude to train through that it's some pains it's some aches it's tired it's it's things you never felt before sometimes so yeah. i i really think that in regards i know i know there have been some changes in regards to the nba mm -hmm. wnba mm -hmm. in regards mm -hmm. to them paying their even with giving paternity leave as well mm -hmm. for is it maternity leave or paternity leave i'm sorry mm -hmm. i don't know which maternity, one maternity leave maternity leave mm -hmm. um giving them leave for them to have a child i think that all sports every single sports that that women are participating in and i think all of the sponsors right. that are sponsoring women should have something in their clause that deal with that we're going to be able to take care of you as well as when you are when you decide that you want because that's your right if you understand where i'm coming from oh, I it's definitely your right understand where you decide that you want to have a family. I think that as a professional uh, sponsor, professional organization, that we should be able to go ahead and let you live through your contract and pay you yep. just like you were performing. I think I, I just personally think like organizations should do that because at the end of the day, you, you're, you want to be behind a product because guess what? You come out of retirement and you come out of retirement. You come out of finishing having your child and you're back performing those sponsorships are like, they want to they wanna be right on you when you're winning. Right, you're right. You know, you're so right. I think they should be something. And, you know, for those who are listening, um, <laughs> you know, hopefully we got some sponsors that's listening to the podcast. <laughs> Look, just make sure that all those that in, in your contract, you need to make sure that you are adhering and being able to support, support maternity leave. I just think it's important, you know, yeah. especially I, in women's I sports. Agree. I definitely agree. Um, it would take a lot of pressure off, um, and it, it would just make it fair. Yeah. I mean, I mean y'all do so much. Yeah. Do, after I was watching, and I, you know, I had to throw this in there. 
after I decided to read the book first, and then I watched the documentary of Michelle Obama becoming. Mm -hmm. And it is so true that I don't think men get an opportunity to really take a, a step back and watch all the sacrifices that women make. You you make a sacrifice to be with somebody with a male or whatever gender, and you decide to have a family. So now you have to take time off from what your career is to make a family to have these kids because you're in a particular time zone or time right. era where you can be able to have kids successfully. Right. Um, and then you want to go back to the sport that you love. So I, I feel like you should be praised a little bit more. And I think that sports should do that. I mean, I think it's it's coming. It's coming. I think a little bit, uh, depending on the sport, they're, they're at least... Um, they're trying to acknowledge it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, all sports, tennis, uh, softball, uh, track, track and field, I just think that all of them, um, soccer, I think I just think they all, they should go ahead and make sure that um, that your jobs are secure. Uh, if you're able to compete, you can compete and that they should continue to pay you and you should get paid your full salary when you, when they, when you decide to let them know you're having a child. I just think that, I mean, that's the least that we could do because we, you know, you you do so much more than what male professional athletes are doing. And it's not to compare, you know, not to compare or, uh, you know, a male athlete to a female athlete. But I just I just think it's just the due diligence of what sports should be doing for for women, point blank, period. And I think the other day, I don't know if you were able to see it, um, that Brazil, um, their soccer team is going to be getting the same pay, equal pay as what the male professional athletes are getting as well in soccer that is really good i hadn't heard that but i think that is really really good it it definitely i wish that was something that was enacted when i was running because it definitely was not that way and yeah. i never when i got pregnant with my first daughter i never felt so much pressure in my life yeah and i'm gonna leave it right there i mean yeah. pressure yeah. pressure and i pressure. had to really sit there and make a decision not for those around me but i had to make a decision for me yeah and Cause she is, she's here, you know, but it was the most pressure I've ever felt in my life. I don't feel that any woman should have to feel that kind of pressure yeah. in that situation because it's not a, it's not a, it's not the pressure that men feel. It doesn't take away. Like I said, there's no, there's not a comparison. It's not here to make a comparison, a comparison or anything, but I just think that no woman should have to feel that way. And I agree with you. I definitely agree with you. You know, going into our next segment, I wanted you to talk about, you know, that feeling of being inducted into the uh, hall of honor. Uh, at University of Texas? Um, it's such a prestige honor. Like, when I went to University of Texas, I knew the different athletes that came before me, um, the things that they had accomplished, the tradition that I was going to join. And then when I got there and um, won my first Big 12 title, won my first NCAA title, our team won our title, I just felt like I was sitting amongst those same athletes that I enjoyed watching growing up and now I had the opportunity to be a part of that and then on top of that I leave the school and then they thought enough of me to bring me back and to induct me into the Hall of Honor and it was great to go back to the University of Texas and experience the environment I haven't been to Austin in years and on top of that I got to take my husband with me to Austin so like he got to experience it and it was just like I remember telling him a few times I never thought I'd be walking through the Hall of Honor with my husband pointing out pictures you know my sister was inducted also, so we're looking at her stuff, and it was just amazing just to be a part of. Like, I'm in there. My picture's up there. I can take my kids, my grandkids, who, you know, they can go see that I was up there. Yeah. I mean, it's just a tremendous experience. I can only imagine, you know, just being able to, and when you're, you know, when you're, when you're as, when you're there as a stu as student athlete, you're not thinking about that because that's after you're retired, when you're not playing anymore, and they decide to bring right. you back five or 10 years later. However, they do the the numbers break down, mm -hmm. but to have that experience to be able to show your kids like, hey, this is what mom did, you know, this is what I did in college, this is what I expect. Maybe you might not be a professional athlete or whatever the case is, but I expect this is what I have future plans for you in regards to going right. to college and doing and doing whatever you're you're great at doing. And so, okay. um, you know, with that being said, you know, let's talk about. You know, you becoming a wife uh, with your husband and, and, and when that all came about and, and just 
you know, what's going on in your life at this particular moment? Um, met my, my husband here in Burlington. Um, he's been so very, very supportive. Uh, my son looks just like him. He, <laughs> he, is, <laughs> he is an amazing father to the kids. Um, I found love in Burlington. <laughs> you say you found love in Burlington. <laughs> um, and anybody who knows him knows him. That's a very prideful thing for him. So I found love in Burlington. But um, right now I am in school. I'm finishing up my last semester uh, before I apply for nursing school. So I applied for nursing school in January. Um, I went to massage therapy school first. Yeah. And I did all that time with massage therapy school. And that um, excited my aspects of wanting to be a nurse. So I went to the University of Texas years ago. So there was courses I had to retake. There were things, so many hurdles that I at one point was just like, man, maybe I just not going to be able to do it. Like, but I had to look at it and embrace it just like anything I did in my career. And I looked at it like, this is my fresh start as far as school is concerned because I went professional. Yeah. So now that I'm retired from that, now I'm starting my school journey and I'm going to accomplish whatever I want to accomplish. So um, my goal is to become a nurse here in the next year and a half. And I would like to be the county medical examiner. So I'm working on that. <laughs> county, it's just, county medical examiner. That's what I would like to do. Okay. So um, currently I am training. I'm always stayed in shape. Um, I can never sit around for too long. I get bored with training when I get really, really in shape. So then I'll stop working out and I'll start back working out. Um, I was working with my cousin she was getting ready for I think it was the all state meet here in North Carolina and um she was doing the long jump and I was working with her on the long jump and her approach and uh helping her with her runway and everything and I was having to demonstrate some things so I went out there ran me a little mile warm up and got out there in the pit and I was showing some stuff and she was recording it for me and I was just watching I was just like man I'm kind of getting out there and I really enjoyed it and I remember coming home telling my husband like I enjoyed that like I had fun and I started having that feeling on the inside that I used to have when I was competing, like that feeling that I want to get back out there. Yeah. So I started getting really, really confident. And I finally decided that I wanted to come back and try for the Olympic trials and the long jump. And Olympic trials would have came and gone already. Olympic games will probably be finishing up right now. And yeah. when they postponed everything, I was talking to my husband about it. And we were just like, you know what, let's go for it. We got more time. And maybe the time happened for a reason. So yeah. I started back training and it's been a, we did a slower process because I'm still working full time. As you hear, you probably hear the muffled scream in the background. Man, man I love all those kids. I, I that's, love, that's, I love that's, that's, that's my life right now. That's why I was man. talking to y'all about like how it's changed. Cause there was a time maybe quiet. But it it's okay. It's, it's it's okay. okay. It's okay. I mean, y'all heard okay. it. It didn't bother me because it's just every day. <laughs> but so now I work full time. School started back up, and then I train two to three times a week. Um, my trainer, strength coach out of Greensboro, Will Bradley. He is amazing. He motivates me every time I go there. Um, I love him. We're doing great things. I'm excited about where things are gonna go. Um, like I said, right now, we're just taking it slow. We're rebuilding, and I'm just yes. excited about it. Like I said, long jump's fun for me, so now I'm just about to have some fun. I got my kids sometimes to practice cheering for me. I didn't have that before, so I got perks. It's, <laughs> it's, look, look at that. It's, it's, look, at a different stage of your life, you get different things that add value more right. to you and what you're right. doing in your current lifetime. So right, that, right, that's, right. That's, that's, that's phenomenal. So with all this stuff that's going on with the pandemic, when are they expecting to uh, have the next Olympics? Um, I, I heard it was supposed to be next year, 2021? June, next year okay. of okay. 2021. Um, we just going to keep eyeballing the schedules and see if they keep pushing anything back. Um, my goal is to try to try to get out and do some jumping, maybe indoor, um, yeah. just to, you know, see where I'm, where I am. And hopefully things will be cleared up more to where I can get out and do some more, um, competitions. But, okay. um, right now it's looking like next year, next June. So we're just going to play it by ear, but that's a whole year longer than what we thought we were going to have. <laughs> so. look, look, you, you have more time, you know, mm -hmm. more time to, to, uh, to go ahead, go along with this journey and, and, and do what you do. I mean, first of all, you're in phenomenal shape and uh, to have three kids married, <laughs> doing your whole career and then thinking about, you know, look, I, I want to, 
go ahead and get back and get myself back into this uh into competition you know uh, yeah. and uh i just want you to know you have our support we will be cheering you on Thank and you uh, i'm much. so proud for you to even announce that here on our podcast to let us know that look we're, i'm planning on going back that's why we could never say former because right. say there's former. always you never say former olympian because there's always an opportunity for you to get back in there and decide that hey you know what no matter my time man at my age if i got it the heart alone i can be able to do it so um you know we, we wish you all the best thank uh, you very in your much. career and we're gonna be cheering you on from here life after sports podcast you, you already know we number one supporter we will be cheering you on that that's right thank you so much i really enjoyed it oh absolutely absolutely so um just to, to, to continue with the podcast now what are what are the things that you've learned you know about yourself in this transition you know uh and I'm, when i say transition i'm talking about you know from your kids from you, you know meeting your husband to the career that you're in now and and the things that you're looking forward to doing like what I, it's a it's a process and i think people don't understand some people may understand because even if you're not an athlete i know this is more this podcast is more about former athletes and current athletes as well um but we all go through a second a second phase of life right. if you know what i mean mm -hmm. all we all go through it mm -hmm. even if we didn't never play professional sports we go through a second phase of life where we have to understand okay this job i've been working for these years or this profession as a professional athlete i've been doing for so long i'm descend i'm i'm transitioning to another phase and so within that phase you know what are some things that you've learned more about yourself one thing i can say the whole time you're asking that question i already knew what my answer was um the resilience i've had to have from every aspect of my life, from my career, to being a mother, to being a wife, to being an athlete, to, to, to be educated. I mean, I have learned that I am so much stronger than I ever thought I was. There were times where I felt like I couldn't go anymore. There's no way, there's no way I can add one more thing to my plate. Because that's what I felt before I started training. I was like, there's no way that this could get any harder. And then yeah. I'm like, and here you go, Vet. You decided that you want to <laughs> you want to go back to doing the long jump not just the long jump, but you want to go compete at the highest level that there is. And I'm up for it and I'm going to do it. And um, I feel like I've overcome so much, so much. And so what's this? It's not going to stop me. No, easy. Look, it's either you go big or you go home. It's either boring. one or two. It's boring. you born for this, though. You, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's boring any other way. Who wants to do it easy? It's boring. <laughs> <laughs> you're right you're absolutely right i mean what are you like i i think about it as a person like if we're not challenging ourselves on an everyday basis what are we really doing you know like there's like are you just going through the motion of life or are you motivating and challenging yourself mentally and physically so that you can attain different things on a whole nother level and i think you're a right. lot of times as people this has nothing to do with athletes or you know just a career person I think as people, sometimes we get stuck in the mundane of our life schedules where mm -hmm. we don't want to see progression or not that we may not want to see progression. We just don't know how to get out of that little box. Mm -hmm. And so I'm so proud of you just talking about your story that hopefully it resonate with the people that are watching and the viewers that's going to be watching in the future um, about learning how to get out of your own way, get out of your box and be able to continue to challenge yourself at different stages in your life. You're right, the because there, there are um, certain points in my life where I really could have got easily complacent with where I was, because um, sometimes change is scary. Um, yeah. to, to step out there and, and want to better yourself, continue to better yourself, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be some hurdles you're going to have to clear. It's scary, but I couldn't help but keep looking up to, OK, now what, now what can I do that's better? Now, now, what can I do this better? And then not just for me, I got babies that are watching me like, and like yeah. they're, they're what, about to be eight, six and two. They know what's going on. Like they watch, 
They see everything. And if I can deter them from making some choices I made, or if I can deter them from making some choices that I didn't make that I know won't be good for them, if I can try to set the best example I can that your mama loves you, you know, your parents love you, will do anything for you to make sure you have everything you need. You know, they see that on top of everything I've ever been through in my life, that mommy kept going, mommy kept studying, Mommy kept wanting that 4.0 in school, which is what I got right now. But I'm just yay, yay, uh, yay, Mommy yay. wants that 4.0. Mommy wants to be an RN. Mommy wants to be, mommy wants her uh, master's. Mommy wants, mommy has all these things and my mommy always went for it, you know? And I'm blessed to be able to say that they can see me going for it and they see my husband supporting me along the way. So if I can just set that for them and my daughter the other day, uh, she told me she was at camp and she was running. They were like, well, one day you're going to be faster than your mom. And she was like, oh, I don't, I don't want to be faster than my mom. And I said, no, you want to be faster. I want you to be faster. I want you to be better. I want you to be greater. Yeah. You know, so I'm constantly trying to be the best person I can be and accomplish the things I want to accomplish because I'm setting, I'm setting the presidents. I'm setting, I'm, I'm dropping stones behind me, like follow the stones, yeah. you know, to be great. Yeah. No, and, you know, it's, it's great to hear you say that, especially knowing that, you know, your young, your daughters and your son, they, they're looking at you there. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand uh, uh, that they, your kids really mimic what they see. Mm -hmm. And so if they see greatness, they, they see someone who's striving for better. They see someone who is, who is not settling. That's what they want to do. Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's great to hear your story because it just shows resiliency. It shows that you have a passion for something. You, ha you show that you're not giving up. And so, um, you know, believe it or not, you know, I'm not a parent. You know, my sister just had twins. And so she's a parent of three right now. So I'm living through her. So right. I told her, like, I could just go and take the kids, bring them right back, you know, <laughs> see them through FaceTime and give them right back to her. Right, right, right. But, um, the fact that your your kids are able to see that, I think that is such a tremendous and um, just a, a tremendous occasion because they can be able to see, you know, what mom is doing and they can be able to follow your blue, your blueprint. And I think yeah. that's so impor important. There's a lot of parents who are not setting blueprints for their kids. So you have kids mm -hmm. out there who are trying to figure out who they are, where I come from, and yeah. why do I belong here? Yeah. And so, you know, having you right now to be able to show that to your kids, I think that is such a tremendous journey yeah it's definitely a blessing it's something that i um i i hold very and i hold it in high regard it's very yeah. important to me i mean looking just looking at their faces looking at their smiles they come they come with me some days to train because sometimes we don't have anyone to watch them you know it's yeah. life it's COVID. you know so we take yeah. them with us to the gym and i'll be doing an exercise or i'll be i'll be uh, going through a circuit or something i'll look over and they want to do something, even if it's body squats, they want to do something. Or at the end of uh, my training, they'll ask Will Bradley, uh, can you time us? Can you time us? Because they want to run. They want to get out there. They want to do something. I mean, my son is constantly, I post about him all the time. He brings me to football and mommy down set hit. Down set hit. I mean, it's just what they know because <laughs> we go out to seven on seven practice because yeah. my husband has a seven on seven team. We go out there, he sees us. He's like, mommy, down set hit. Are you march set go? Like he wants to run. So they see it, you know? So. And it's fun for him. Yeah. And I love it. I love that your your husband is so supportive of what you're doing. I think that's that's that makes it that makes the journey even more easier to know that you have support not only from your, you know, your family, your kids, but your husband as well. And I think that that makes everything in retrospect, it makes it well worth it because you know you're not fighting this battle alone. You're doing yeah. it for everybody else that's around you in your camp. And your camp is not just only your trainers and all that stuff. But your camp right. is your, it's your kids, your husband, your parents. Mm -hmm. I got a whole family. I got the chiropractor. I got the sports medicine doctor. Look I got at nutritionist. You. Look at you. Look all at these you. people sitting you. in my table. I got a table. <laughs> you know, That's so, what's up. And everybody's, that is what's up. Um, everyone's contributing in their own way. Yeah. So I had another question for you. you know, what advice would you like to share to professional athletes who are uncertain about this journey and what's expected, you know, based on what you went through, based on your, you know, with your family and, and just your experience and now getting ready to qualify back for the Olympics, you know, based on your journey, what advice can you give to a professional athlete uh, who is uncertain about their journey, about this whole journey and, and what is expected? What, what is the, if there's one sentence that you could put together or a thought, what would it be? 
I think you have to accept the fact that you're not always in control. Mm. As an athlete, you, you, as a professional athlete, you feel, you feel like this is what my life is. This is what it's going to be. This is what I'm trying to do. So this, is what, this is it. And, and life's going to throw curveballs at you. Um, Career-wise, some things outside of your career is going to throw a curveball at you. It's going to affect your career. So things may not always go exactly the way you think they're going to happen. And you have to just be prepared to keep trucking through. Um, and know that just because it's delayed at that point doesn't mean it's necessarily denied. It just might be at a later time. And it just might be a different way. Okay. That's what I would say. Okay. That that is some great advice. That is great advice. I I hope all our viewers that's watching they take this advice because uh it's important. It's definitely important. So with our women in sports series, what we've been doing, um, you're our second host that we've had on the show in regards to mm -hmm. our women in, in sports series. So the reason I have a hashtag women in sports series is because prior to that, we've been interviewing a lot of males. Mm -hmm. And so in regards to different careers, NFL. NBA, mm -hmm. um, MOB, and so, hey, whoever's screaming back there, I don't know if it's London, Peyton, you know, little, little man, you know. That'll everybody. be Trey. That's Trey. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Trey. So with that yeah. being said, you know, our, our last question was just, we asked all of our guests that are part of the Women in Sports series, if they can be able to list three women that they would like to nominate, right? Three. If you can nominate three women that you would like to nominate to tell their stories uh, on on our women in women in sports series, who would you nominate? And mind you, they can be former athletes, they can be current athletes, they can be uh, just people who work as sports in the sports industry as sure. professionals. Mm -hmm. So if you have any of those names, you can list those names. I'm gonna reach back out to you so that I can be able to make sure that I DM them and get their information because I want to highlight, you know, to be honest with you, I, I started this podcast just to be able to highlight the transition of professional athletes. People think that, okay, after they're finished playing the sport, like their careers are done. No, their careers are just started. They started a the platform and now they're on a second phase of life. And I want to be able to tell your story, but I want you to tell the story and you to be authentic with it. And so that's the, that's the reason why we have this show called life after sports. So, if there's three young women, or however you want to say, that would love to tell their story, that you would like to nominate, I would love for you to go ahead and express their names. Well, the first person I'd like to nominate is my sister. Um, she's a Olympic volleyball player, silver medalist. Definitely would love for her to tell her story. Destiny. Um, she's a, yeah, her name is Destiny. She's a phenomenal athlete. So I definitely um, nominate her. Um, the second person... I would say I want to nominate. Um, she played basketball at the University of Texas. I can't exactly say, I can't remember exactly what professional team she played for, but her name is Tiffany Jackson. Okay. Um, she is a breast cancer survivor. Okay. And uh, when I was living in Dallas, you know, we, we watched her deal with a lot of adversity at home. Um, and then she turned around and she fought cancer and still came back. So she is someone who has always, I've always admired her and, my, and, and admired her story. So I really, really would recommend her. And lastly, I would say Allison Felix would be someone I think that would be great to bring to your podcast. Um, she, um, really headed up the, revol the the revolution or evolution that changed the whole um, women in track and field having babies and it being an issue and possibly losing contracts. She really stood really, really strong for that and made some noise about that. So yeah. I really think, as, you know, as we talked about that, the, the difference in having a family and what that effect has, a lot of women, I'll say, suffered, you know, through that. And she's someone who finally just stood up and said enough's enough. Enough's so enough. I think that um, Allison Felix would be a great person to bring to the podcast as well. Okay. I, look, you gave me three tremendous names, and I appreciate them. Uh, excellent, phenomenal players, uh, professional athletes that I think would come on the show and definitely represent as well. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate for you nominating them so that they can be able to tell their story. And hopefully through their stories, it's helping either professional, uh, current professional athletes that are still playing uh, or former uh, who are not playing, who are trying to figure out what that transition process is mm -hmm. and just hearing their story. I think a lot of times as 
as people, not with no titles, as people, I think we heal through hearing stories from other people. Most and definitely. I think that, and that's how we relate and that's how we become, you know, how that's how we navigate through this uh, transition through life. So uh, I, I, I appreciate you nominating those three and I appreciate your story. I think a lot of people have received a lot of information about who you are as a person, <laughs> who you are in regards to your character and not and who you are in regards to what you're about to do in That's regards right. to your future and right. so i am excited uh to be a part of that journey and i want you to know that life after sports podcast the host kevin johnson is here supporting you and everybody <laughs> who makes this show happen we're supporting you in your endeavors and we appreciate you for coming on this show and being able to talk about your story well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Y'all tune in. Make sure y'all go follow him. It's my brother, y'all. Good people. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. And thank you for giving me a platform. Thank you so much. You have a great night. Tell your husband I said hello. And the hey, kids, hey, tell him up. Hey. Is he there? <laughs> yeah. Is, is, he's there. Tell him I said, where he at? Where he at? Where he over here. He's going to poke his head in. These kids poke are dragging me, man. I'm like, I'm trying to keep the kids under control. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's okay, man. Where you at, man? Let me at least just say hello, oh, man. Where hi, man. At? Hey, man. Hey, man. What's going on? <laughs> How you doing, my brother? All right. Doing, all right man. doing good, man. I appreciate you guys taking the time to get on here tonight. I appreciate hearing your story. Thank you so much for being on our episode, episode 20, Life After Sports. Marsha Vett, Hooker, Flintall. I appreciate you. Thank Take you. Care, okay. All right. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.